Um, welcome everyone to the webinar, Holding Pennsylvania Utilities Accountable, What Every Renewable Energy Advocate Should Know. We have a lot of uh, high political intrigue tonight, as well as some very practical information about what, uh, you know, what Pennsylvanians can do to uh, contribute to a, a, a fairer energy system and hold utilities accountable. I'd like to oops, introduce our speakers for tonight. Um, sorry, here we go. So uh, first we'll hear from Dave Anderson. He's the Policy and Communications Manager at the Energy and Policy Institute. Dave has been working at the nexus of clean energy and public policy since 2008. Prior to joining the Energy and Policy Institute, he was outreach coordinator for the Climate and Energy Program at the Union of Concerned Scientists. He's also an alumnus of the Sierra Club and the Alliance for Climate Protection, now the Climate Reality Project. Dave's research has helped to spur investigations into political attacks on clean energy and climate, sci climate science by powerful special interests, such as ExxonMobil and the American Legislative Exchange Council, known as ALEC. His work has been cited by major media outlets such as CBS News and the Wall Street Journal, and he has served as speaker on panels at national solar industry conferences. Dave holds an MA in political science from the University of New Hampshire, where he also received a BA in humanities. And our second speaker tonight is Mark Shebist. He is a senior attorney in the Climate and Clean Energy Program at the Natural Resources Defense Council. Mark advocates for clean energy policies in Pennsylvania that will cut pollution, create quality jobs, and promote environmental, racial, and economic justice. His areas of focus include energy efficiency and conservation, greenhouse gas limits and pricing, electricity utility rate making, and energy markets. Before joining NRDC, Shibist works at worked as a staff attorney for Citizens for Pennsylvania's Future, where he focused on shale gas drilling litigation and policy. He has also worked as a consumer bankruptcy attorney and, a and as a technical writer. A native of Williamsport, Pennsylvania, Shebist holds a bachelor's degree in comparative literature from Princeton University and a law degree from Temple University. He is based in NRDC's Washington, D.C. office. And my name is Henry McKay. I'm the Pennsylvania Program Director and Heartland Regional Director of Solar United Neighbors. We are a national nonprofit organization that helps people go solar, join together, and fight for the energy rights. Now, this probably isn't your first Zoom, uh, considering the world we live in, but but uh, the way we're do, doing things tonight, just as a refresher, um, we will have time to have everyone ask questions uh, towards the end of the webinar, and you can do that using the Q&A feature. You should see that Q&A button down at the bottom or the top of your screen on your Zoom console. And you're welcome to send messages using the chat. We're, we're going to be looking at the Q&A Q &A box for, for questions. So if you have questions, put them in there. But if you have any technical difficulties or trouble hearing anybody, you can send us a message in a chat. We can try to help you out. And just a preview of what we're going to talk about. So first, Dave will be talking about the first energy corruption scandal in Ohio and its impact on Pennsylvania ratepayers. Pay and then we'll hand it over to Mark, who will be talking about utilities, regulation, and where you come in. And then we'll have time for questions at the end. And now I'm going to stop my screen share and Dave, you can take it away. Okay, let me just get my screen up here. And while Dave is doing that, maybe people could put in the chat where you are uh, joining us from. Um, or, uh, and also if you know your electric utility, your electric distribution company, you could put that in there too. And you can also put that in the Q and A if you're unable to access the chat. Um, so this is embarrassing, but new laptop, and apparently I need to authorize sharing my screen through Zoom, which I've got to figure out. Can we switch the order up in the impromptu fashion? Yeah, or if you like, I can share. 
I can share your slides and I can just advance them for you. Yeah, that, that might be the best bet. This time. All right. No Sorry worries. about that. It happens. Okay. Logistics. Okay, Dave, let me know when you see your slide up there. All right, looks good. Um, so I am Dave Anderson. I am the Policy and Communications Manager for the Energy and Policy Institute. Um, we're a pro clean energy watchdog group that works to expose attacks on clean energy by fossil fuel and utility interests. Um, and over the past few years, a big focus of our work has been on um, some bailout campaigns in Ohio and also in other states um, like Pennsylvania and even nationally during the Trump administration. Um, but we're basically various um, policymakers and utilities. We're looking to bail out um, old nuclear and coal plants that couldn't compete with newer and cleaner types of energy um, through ratepayer subsidies. Um, you can go to the next slide. Probably one of the most uh, infamous pieces of legislation like this was what's known as House Bill 6. Um, and I'm sure you might have seen some headlines about it come out today, um, which we'll get to. But essentially, um, after seeking bailouts from the Public Utility Commission of Ohio um, and state legislature for a number of years, First Energy finally got its way with this massive bill um, that provided a billion dollars in bailouts for um, some nuclear plants owned by a bankrupt subsidiary of First Energy named First Energy Solutions. And the bill also provided an increase in um, bailout subsidies for two coal plants owned by the Ohio Valley Electric Company, which is basically owned by some big utilities like AEP, Duke Energy, AES, and then some smaller ones that are based out of Ohio. The law also rolled back Ohio's um, clean energy standards which required the utilities to um, help customers save money and also invest more in renewable energy. And um, there were also some other nifty tricks in there that gave millions more dollars um, to First Energy, basically for not much doing much of anything. Go to the next slide. So even before we started to hear about um, a federal investigation into how this bill was made law, um, people were starting to become very concerned just about the sheer amount of money that was spent on ads supporting the bill's passage and then defeating an effort to put the bill on the ballot um, so that voters would have a shot for, to overturn it um, in the fall of 2017. And just via ad disclosures, people were tracking the total spent um, well in excess of the tens of millions of dollars going into groups with names like Ohioans for gen uh, energy security generation now a lot of people suspected the money was probably mostly coming from First Energy, but it was really hard to prove that. Um, and some of the messaging was just overtly racist and targeting um, Asian Americans and making it sound like petition signature collectors who were trying to get the issue on the ballot um, were coming to steal your personal info and send it to the communist government in China, which is pretty laughably false, but they spent a lot of money promoting um, those lies, sadly. Next slide. So for those who watched all this play out over the course of a year and wondered if it was really legal, um, last summer, the FBI arrested former Ohio House Speaker Larry Householder and a um, handful of political consultants and lobbyists, and also charged one of the dark money groups generation now um, with participating in what they called a $60 million bribery scheme um, to secure the speakership for Larry Householder um, during the 2018 elections, and then also ram through and defend um, this bill, House Bill 6. Next slide. This is just a, a different view um, that another group, the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis put together following the money from what federal prosecutors um, initially called First Energy and we now know um, based on some admissions that First Energy made in civil lawsuits and today in a plea deal with the federal prosecutors um, is actually First Energy and how it flowed really through this kind of crazy network of uh, various front groups, for-profit consulting firms, all to try to hide the money so that it would be tough to trace it back to First Energy um, and then how the money passed through 
and some weird ways to also personally benefit um, the folks who were charged in um, that big federal criminal case last summer. Next slide. So after those events last July, first really put the issue back on the radar as a major corruption scandal in Ohio. Um, in October, November, First Energy fired its CEO and its chief lobbyist. And then the following month, um, the Public Utility Commission of Ohio Chairman Sam Randazzo had one of his townhouses in Columbus raided by the FBI. They left with laptops and lots of records and boxes. And around the same time in a filing, First Energy said that it had um, an SEC filing paid $4.3 million to an individual or their consulting firm shortly before they became an Ohio utility regulator um, who then acted on the company's behalf because of that payment while they were in that regulatory position. And the plea agreement that First Energy um, signed into that was made public today admitted that that individual, I guess it didn't name him, but it's pretty obvious uh, that it could have only been him since it named that person as the PUCO chairman um, during the time frame that all these events played out. Next slide. Um, this is just a, the SEC filing kind of hidden at the end of many hundreds of pages in a quarterly report that they filed last year, um, talking about how they had paid money to this individual in January 2019, who then got a big job regulating Ohio utilities and essentially did the company's bidding. So even last November or so, um, once we found this um, little tidbit and helped reporters understand what it meant, it was pretty obvious that essentially First Energy was admitting to bribing a public official. Um, next slide. And the story of Sam Randazzo is also very interesting because um, he'd always been fairly cozy with First Energy and also involved uh, with anti-wind groups in Ohio, um, fighting different wind turbine projects. And the Cleveland City Council is actually now considering launching a formal investigation into whether First Energy might have been um, pulling some of the ropes and opposing a big offshore wind project on Lake Erie um, that was also opposed with secret spending by Murray Energy, a big coal company. Next slide. Um, and Mr. Randazzo, before he became PUCO chairman, and we found out that he'd been paid apparently $22 million since 2010 by First Energy to do something. Uh, also led a group called the Industrial Energy Users of Ohio and worked at the McNeese Law Firm, where he just um, was always trying to pursue new limits on um, the siting of wind farms in particular, and also just attacking Ohio's clean energy standards that were ultimately eliminated by House Bill 6. Next slide. So lots of uh, big headlines coming up over the scandal over the past year. I think there's a lot more to learn um, still. As I said, First Energy ousted its um, CEO and that's been followed by I think five or six other high profile firings at the companies and cut back on its lobbying spending and politically uh, political spending, at least publicly. Next slide. And Research um, done by the Energy and Policy Institute, a lot of great reporters and watchdog groups has traced um, more dark money um, since these revelations came out last year to other dark money groups that supported Governor Mike DeWine in Ohio and his daughter. Um, and one of those dark money groups was entirely funded by First Energy. So not looking too great for him either right now. Next slide. A key question um, that we've now been pursuing at the Energy and Policy Institute and um, that's being pursued by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and a number of state public utility commissions is, did First Energy use ratepayer money um, to finance any of this major bribery scandal or even you know other sketchy things that you're not really supposed to use ratepayer money for like um, political contributions and um, different contributions to dark money groups that are regulated by the IRS. So what we found essentially is um, that, uh, this slide actually got clipped a little bit, but basically um, the First Energy Service Company, which provides services to all of First Energy's utilities in a number of states, um, 
had paid about $60 million to Generation Now and another dark money group that was named to the plea agreement today um, between 2017 and 2019. Um, but they only had to report or they only reported 1.2 million in donations and 6.6 .6 million in political expenditures to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Um, so that's a pretty big discrepancy between a little over 7 million and well over $60 million um, routed through that service company. And um, we also found that it, the various First Energy subsidiaries, I think there's 13 of them, had um, reported spending well in excess of uh, over um, I think it was 100 million on um, external affairs payments to the service company. Um, and we're kind of asking the question of whether ratepayers had uh, been charged for that money. Next slide. So turned out we were on the uh, right track because a couple of weeks later during an earnings um, call, First Energy admitted that for 10 plus years it had um, misused customer money and in response to financial analyst questions also revealed that money went to political and lobbying spending and also to um, that $4.3 million payment to Mr. Randazzo right before he was appointed PUCO chairman. Um, and more recently in some quarterly reports to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, basically all of um, First Energy's regulated subsidiaries have admitted that they were part of that essentially money was being pulled in to the service company from all these different um, utilities like Panelec and the other first energy utilities in Pennsylvania and then routed into the central lobbying and political spending operation at the service company. And some of that money, it turns out was ratepayer money. So the company is now saying it's gonna refund that money, not saying how much money is involved total or when the refunds will be expected. So. Don't hold your breath to get a nice check in the mail or um, a, a deduction on your bill until regulators really take the reins here and force them to disclose more and do something about it. Um, next page. So I did reach out to the Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission spokesperson um, about First Energy admitting that it misused uh, money collected from Pennsylvania ratepayers um, in the context of um, that this Larry Householder case. So they got back to me and just said, we have no information at this time, which is pretty weird <laughs> thing to say in response to a question that important, but um, perhaps they have something that they're doing that they can't talk about publicly yet. Next page. So while all this was playing out, um, First Energy was simultaneously pursuing along with Exelon, a major lobbying campaign for a $500 million bailout um, from Pennsylvania ratepayers for what they called zero emissions nuclear legislation. Basically just would have given money um, to help keep nuclear plants that were struggling open. Um, overall, from the clean energy perspective, not necessarily a bad thing if the goal is to keep carbon out of the air, um, but given the companies that were pursuing that and their track weather good of uh, trustworthiness, not necessarily uh, viewed as a legitimate need for a bailout there. Um, next page. So here we can just see um, the lobbyists that and uh, PR firms that First Energy Solutions, which was bankrupt at the time, employed to work on its Ohio um, bailout campaign and also worked um, on its campaign in Pennsylvania. Um, so there's some crossover there, but the biggest one was a $68 million law and lobbying firm that worked on the bankruptcy case and lobbied for FES um, for a few years. And they ended up walking away from that case for about $68 million, some of which is, which is now being held up by the bankruptcy job over, judge over questions about their participation in the bribery scheme <clears throat> and then various other millions and hundreds of thousands of dollars. And way at the bottom, you can see uh, former Homeland Security Director Tom Bridges lobbying firm, um, which is still employed by FES's predecessor, Energy Harbor, as a lobbyist um, received for its work in Pennsylvania. Uh, next page. So as I mentioned, the bankruptcy job who oversaw this First Energy Solutions bankruptcy case 
um, has put a, a hold on paying Aiken Gump, the lobbying firm, its final fees um, from FES, and also asked several of their lobbyists to file sworn declarations regarding their relationship with some of the defendants in the Larry Householder criminal case who pled guilty. Um, so those are kind of on hold as everyone waited to see what the Department of Justice ended up doing around that case and with First Energy, um, but eventually maybe made public. And it'll be interesting to see what the bankruptcy judge does because he has said that he has the ability to claw back really any money that he feels like is implicated in a criminal scheme in a bankruptcy case. So you could be talking about a lot of money coming out of that new company, um, Energy Harbor, and being put to use somewhere else, presumably. Uh, next page. And um, this just a, a look at a few of the other ongoing investigations that um, First Energy faces. So they seem to have resolved the Department of Justice investigation with this plea agreement today, but also different states, including Ohio, New Jersey, and likely soon Maryland are looking into this question of whether ratepayer money was misused in support of this bribery scheme. Um, the Securities and Exchange Commission is also investigating First Energy over the passage of this bill, and the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is similarly looking at questions about um, First Energy's accounting of the lobbying and political expenses involved in passing House Bill 6 in Ohio. Um, next slide. So that's it for me. Um, that's my email address if you have any questions that don't get answered on the webinar tonight or just want to chat, happy to talk. Thank you, Dave. And, and Mark, we can pass it over to you and then we'll have time for questions at the end. I see some people have been already putting questions into the chat in the Q&A. Great, thanks. I will uh, share my screen here. All right, is this now uh, visible? Yes. All right, I think I will need to uh, do it in a way that uh, shows the appropriate kind of layout. Um, now this bar is blocked, maybe. Hold on, I'll figure this out. Uh, thanks everybody for uh, having me on. Henry, thanks for inviting me to be here tonight. Uh, again, I'm Mark Shebus. I'm an attorney with the Natural Resources Defense Council. And I'm going to talk about more mundane, uh, I guess, behavior, but I think no less important than what Dave talked about. Dave's presentation involved some pretty extraordinary and extreme bad behavior on a part of one particular utility holding company. The subject of my presentation is basically going to be how do we get electric utilities in Pennsylvania to be accountable to the public and to serve the public interest in the way they need to serve it? Historically, the public interest when it came to utility regulation with electric utilities was mostly about safety, affordability, and reliability in electricity service. These days, it needs to be about more. And I think of particular interest to this audience is that it needs to be about making a transition from the relatively dirty energy system we have now to a much cleaner system in which we are eliminating greenhouse gas emissions on a net basis by 2050. So here's a brief overview of the presentation. I'm going to talk first a little bit about what electric distribution companies in Pennsylvania do. And as we'll discuss, that's the sort of trade name for electric utilities here. Uh, what the Public Utility Commission, which regulates electric distribution companies, does. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about, you know, elaborate on what we just said about what we mean by the public interest, and then talk about some of the ways that we have to, uh, to engage with electric distribution companies in the Public Utility Commission. And I don't know if I can, I assume you can all see this bar that I'm moving. I don't know how to hide that. Um, so we can't um, see that mark. Oh, you can. Okay, great. It's just on my screen. Terrific. All right. So what companies provide electric service in Pennsylvania? 
Uh, there are basically three different kinds of electric utilities. The first is electric distribution companies. And these are corporations that are either, either public, publicly traded or private, and they're owned by investors. And the sort of generic name which you see used in you know, jurisdictions across the United States is investor-owned utility or I, IOU. And these companies are all regulated by the Public Utility Commission. Then we have municipality-owned uh, utilities, which you know, in, in sort of trade parlance are often called munis. Generally, these are not regulated by the Public Utility Commission on the electricity side. Um, there are a few that are the uh, electric utilities in Wellsboro, Lewisburg, I think Pike County. Uh, all those are municipally owned and all are regulated by the Public Utility Commission. Basically, munis are not regulated by the PUC when they serve only the residents of their municipality. When their service area extends beyond the borders of the municipality, then they are subject to Public Utility Commission regulation. Third, there are rural electric co-ops. And I saw from the, the, the chat, there are at least a couple people on the call tonight who live in areas served by the rural electrics. And these are uh, also not regulated by the Public Utility Commission. They are owned uh, by their members. Um, nationwide, only about 6% of electric utilities are investor-owned uh, utilities. But that 6% of utilities serves almost 70% of electric utility customers. Uh, and by contrast, there are greater numbers of both municipality-owned utilities and uh, rural electric co-ops, but they serve many fewer customers and deliver much less electricity. Uh, this map shows where Pennsylvania's investor-owned electric distribution companies are. Um, the, uh, the purple swath in Philadelphia and its suburbs is Pico. Uh, the, the blue swath, light blue swath, sort of above that that covers most of the eastern portion of the state is uh, PPL. The orange swath on the western part of the state uh, that covers Pittsburgh and some of the suburbs is Duquesne Light Company. And the green and uh, pink uh, swaths and, and, and sort of gray swaths are uh, the first energy owned utility companies when there are four of them in Pennsylvania, we'll get into that. But before that, I wanted to show you also where the rural electric co-ops serve. Um, and basically, if you put these two maps together, it doesn't exactly jive because it's different scales. And, and I think at this high level of granularity, there's some weird overlap. But basically, you can see that the areas uh, that are not covered, the area in this map that's pink, the area not served by investor-owned utilities is the area served by the rural electric co-ops. Uh, and this is a screenshot from uh, the Pennsylvania Rural Electric Association which is the trade association for these co-ops. So what is an electric distribution company? Why are they electric distribution companies and not electric utilities? Well, they are electric utilities, but an electric distribution company is a particular kind of electric utility. Electric distribution companies are only in the business of distributing electricity distribution. And I've, I've put here in the slide, the definition of electricity distribution that is available on uh, the PUC's website. But basically the business of, a, of an electric distribution company in Pennsylvania is to maintain the infrastructure, the poles and the wires and the substations that deliver electricity to our homes and businesses. The, electricity, the electric distribution companies do not own power plants or any other distribution resources. And why is that? Well. You know, if you're of a certain age, then you remember a time when the utilities did own generation, and it wasn't that long ago. Uh, it was basically until 1996. Uh, and the, uh, the, the statute, it's like a uh, misstatement uh, here, but it's the Pennsylvania Electricity Choice and Generation Competition Act of 1996. It forced the investor-owned utilities, which had some of the same names they have now, slightly different, to spin off the power plants that they owned at the time. The theory was that the distribution of electricity is a natural monopoly, and we'll get into that in a minute, meaning that it makes sense to have only a single company that is, has uh, the poles and wires that deliver electricity to our homes. 
we don't want two companies running two separate sets of wires down every street competing for business. It's a very inefficient use of resources. On the other hand, generation, electricity generation was perceived to be uh, a potentially rich competitive, not rich, but um, an area where competition among power plants could result in uh, fairer prices, better prices for consumers. So now electricity generation is not regulated by the Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission. It's basically, you know, what power plants run and how much money they make is basically determined by a wholesale electricity market system we have. Uh, and the markets are run by a, uh, a, an entity that's a regional transmission organization called the PJM Interconnection. That's a whole separate uh, presentation we won't, won't get into tonight, but I just wanted to mention that. Electricity distribution, on the other hand, remains uh, subject to regulation by the Public Utility Commission. So, so who are the uh, EDCs, the electric distribution companies in Pennsylvania? Uh, I went through them be before briefly, but we have PICO covering Philadelphia and suburbs, PPL covering a big chunk of the eastern part of the state, including the, the metropolitan areas, Harrisburg, Lancaster, Lehigh Valley, uh, Wyoming Valley, uh, Duquesne Light Company covering the city of Pittsburgh and some of its suburbs, and then all the rest of the state that is not uh, covered by the rural electric co-ops and the, municipal, uh, the municipal-owned electric utilities are covered by the four first energy electric distribution companies, Penn Power, West Penn Power, NetEd, and Penelope. Who owns the EDCs? Well, they're investor owned, but who are the investors? And that's a, a different answer with each of the utilities. And uh, I just put up uh, for an example, this screen is from uh, Duquesne Light Company's website and it shows their particular ownership structure. They are most, well, entirely owned by uh, uh, institutional investors, basically, via uh, private equity firms. Uh, two of the electric distribution companies in Pennsylvania, uh, well, five actually, Pico and the four First Energy uh, utilities are owned by holding companies. So First Energy, the company that Dave was basically talking about, is a utility holding company that owns the four distribution companies that, that serve areas of Pennsylvania. Pico is owned by a different utility holding company called Exelon, uh, which also owns generation resources. However, they're kind of splitting up. But just this slide gives you an indication of sort of um, how, well, there's been a move, I think, over recent years toward more institutional uh, private equity investment in uh, investor-owned utilities rather than, you know, you know, Jane and John Doe across the street holding stock in that company. The Public Utility Commission, that is the entity in the state that regulates electric distribution companies. Uh, it is an independent state agency, meaning not, unlike the DEP or the DCED or the Department of Labor and Industry, the Public Utility Commission is not under the government. It's independent of the government. And it's five commissioners, and only th in th no more than three can be of a particular party, are appointed or nominated by the governor, but then confirmed by the Senate. And because the Public Utility Commission is, is an independent commission, the governor cannot install acting commissioners. He can in cases of, of the executive agencies like the DEP, and then that individual could act in an acting capacity until confirmed or rejected. With the PUC, the governor can't do that. And for folks who are following this closely, that's a big issue in Pennsylvania because we have right now four commissioners, but one of them, his seat has expired. He's able to hold over until basically the end of September, but then he has to leave. And the reason we will be down to three commissioners in October is that the, the Senate Republicans have refused to confirm any nominees by Governor Wolf until the governor pulls back the Reggie regulation. Um, so that's, we can get into that later if people want, but it's a really, it's, it's a bad, bad thing. Um, just briefly, the, the Public Utility Commission doesn't just regulate electric utilities, it also regulates gas utilities, water utilities, and telecommunication utilities, and also limousine and taxi services. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, there, there are other things the Public Utility Commission does, 
one of its most recent duties is uh, has some pipeline safety uh, duties under a law passed, I think, in 2012. Why do we have PC, PUC regulation at all? Well, this sort of brings up the, the kind of weird question of like, how can these privately owned companies, or at least investor owned, be considered public utilities? What makes them public? And the answer is they are providing an essential public service that all the members of the public depend upon. We all need electricity service in a modern world. And utilities have to offer it to anybody who's willing to pay for it and comply with the conditions of, of service. I mentioned before that utilities are quote unquote natural monopolies, meaning that it just makes more sense economically for a single company to be performing the duty uh, than for multiple companies to be competing in that space. It's a, it's, it would be a poor use of economic resources not to do that. So generally when we have monopolies, it, you know, good policy means breaking them up, even though we, you know, we have not done a good job at that over the last 40 years. But when it comes to utility service, the traditional answer, and I think probably still the best answer, is regulation. Uh, and the basic deal is that you know, these companies get an exclusive right to serve a particular area of the Commonwealth, but they have to be subject to sort of more regulation from the Public Utility Commission than a normal business would. Historically, the main goal of PUC regulation was to restrain the monopoly power that the uh, utility has to mimic competitive forces and therefore ensure fair prices for customers and, and safety and reliable service. And, and public interest was measured by whether investments were prudent in poles and wires and at the time power plants, whether there was efficient operation and whether rates were just and reasonable. So fair prices, safety and reliability. That was what the public interest was for most of the time we've been regulating electric utilities. That's changed, again, in, a, in an era of climate change uh, and income and wealth and equality and all the, and all the uh, hardship and, and pain that that's brought. Um, public interest, I think a lot of people have realized means something different, even in the context of utility regulation. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about environment and climate, but no longer, it, it's no longer just okay for utilities to, to provide safe and reliable electricity services. We need them to be partners in integrating more distributed renewables like solar panels. We need them to be partners in making a transition to electric vehicles. We need them to be partners in helping customers save money through efficiency and conservation rather than just using more. Of it. Um, and we need them to be partners in equity too. You know, the, the, we have record levels of income and wealth inequality, and it means that the public is more fractured in a way than, than it's been for a very long time uh, in terms of what, 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 what do you do to make energy affordable, affordable for all customers. Um, and so that's all going on. And at the same time, over the last 40 years, um, we've seen a lot of really bad thinking about the comments about whether the public interest is something that even exists and we should pay attention to. Uh, and, and one of the really tricky things with utilities is how do we get them to have real allegiance to a public interest that is not just the interest of their shareholders? Um, and so like this, this slide, my idea was to sort of say, we, the first step in talking about utility accountability is really to sort of examine that question of what it means for utilities to be acting in the public interest these days. And I gave kind of a high level uh, view of what, what I think that means, but obviously there's a lot more detail we could go into and if we, if we have time, I'm sure we will. Um, one of the sort of, to, to pull back of what that means, how, how we get utilities to serve the public interest for a clean and equitable energy future is, is about reforming the basic utility business model. Uh, there was a time when utilities were just in the mode of constant growth. Electric uh, demand was constantly increasing. Utilities made money by building more stuff. And as long as you know, there was no issue or no perceived issue with using more and more electricity, that, that was okay. But we need new business models now. And there are various sort of organizations that have thought about how we do this. And one of particularly good resource, I think, is a Rocky Mountain Institute report from a couple of years ago, I put the link here. 
Um, and it talks about in, in quite a lot of detail about what reforming utility business models could mean. Um, creating new business opportunities uh, that, uh, for clean energy services. Um, and I've highlighted the, the, the third item here, uh, making utilities partners in achieving social and policy goals related to electricity generation and management of the grid. And the fourth bullet is also important. We need to enable them to do that in a way that enables them to continue to make money. Utilities do need to make money because they need to continue to attract investment in their systems. Um, you know, so they need to be able to offer a rate of return that is, is competitive at some level. So uh, avenues for utility accountability. Um, basically, I've listed four here, and apologies for the noise outside of some very loud car. Um, I'm going to mute for just a second. All right, sorry about that. It's uh, not moving, but um, so there are basically four avenues. Uh, you have uh, engagement at the PUC and various proceedings there. You have advocacy at the legislature, which is extremely important because the PUC um, only has the powers delegated to it by the legislature. And then uh, you also have direct engagement with the electric utilities and shareholder and consumer activism. And I realize we're, uh, we don't have much time left. So I'm gonna go through these last slides very quickly so that we have enough time for questions. Um, basically, this slide shows a lot of the different proceedings at the Public Utility Commission. The first bullet, I, I would say, are the sort of core, the most important proceedings, but there are literally tens of different types of proceedings that happen there that relate to electric utilities. And there are different ways for the public to participate. You can formally intervene uh, and become a party to a case. You need to be represented by a lawyer to do that. You can file written comments. Uh, sometimes there are public hearings where you can, you can deliver oral comments. Uh, there's some key players who are at most of these proceedings. So-called statutory advocates include the Office of Consumer Advocate and the Office of Business Advocate. Those offices were created in the 1970s. The consumer advocate basically represents the interest of residential consumers. Small business advocate is what it sounds like. There is also low income advocates. PULP is the acronym for the Pennsylvania Utility Law Project, which specifically represents the interest of low, interest, low income consumers and proceedings before the, before the commission. And there are some other organizations who are at these uh, proceedings most of the time, uh, retail electric suppliers and trade groups especially. Um, Again, quickly, uh, engagement at the legislature is super important because the PUC only has the powers delegated to by the legislature. And the Public Utility Commission in Pennsylvania has historically been very conservative in the way it interprets its powers. It's very reluctant to sort of make policy unless it's very, very, very clear that the legislature has given it the authority to do so. Um, and then finally, you know, we can engage with utilities uh, through other means. Uh, first of all, we can engage there, you know, despite the, the kind of bad behavior that Dave described, there are at these, these companies a lot of good people who are trying to do good things. Uh, and we can talk with them and figure out ways to help them make change inside the companies. Um, we can engage in various kinds of activism. Uh, there's a, a, a nonprofit in, in Philadelphia called Power which has been mounting a campaign uh, with PICO in, in collaboration with the Earthquake or Action Team for several years. Um, shareholder activism, I think, you know, you don't have to get into that detail. I don't know a whole lot about that, but that's an obvious an, an avenue. And then finally, one, one way to get the utilities to behave better is to get the Public Utility Commission, which regulates the utilities to behave better. And, and that is sort of an idea that people are starting to think about. We need the utility commission to make good decisions. What do we do when they make bad decisions? How do we hold them accountable? They are not elected officials, they're appointed, but they're also not used to, I think, public pressure. And so that's something that people are increasingly exploring and I think something we're gonna see uh, discussed more and more. Uh, so thank you, I will stop there. Hopefully I've left enough time for the questions we have. Thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, so we, we do have some questions in here and I will read them out, I think in the order that they came in. Um, 
So I have a question here from, from Janine. Uh, which regulators, this is something I think, uh, this is a question for Dave from his presentation, but which regulators are taking the lead on the investigation? Uh, this is the investigation into First Energy. Hmm. Um, depending on where you're looking, that would be the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is the top utility regulator for the country. Um, and they actually had an audit of First Energy's finances going on throughout the whole passage of House Bill 6. Um, and then decided to launch a more specific investigation after the criminal case became known last summer, <clears throat> looking at um, issues related to how First Energy paid for that lobbying and other apparently bribery uh, things, as we now know um, from today's court filings. So there's also the Securities and Exchange Commission is the nation's top regulator um, for Wall Street and things like that. And they're taking a look at First Energy too. And then there's various state public utility commissions that are supposed to serve ratepayers um, in Ohio, New Jersey, um, likely soon Maryland and as far as I know, nothing's happened in Pennsylvania, unfortunately, um, around that issue of what, some ratepayer money that seems to have been caught up in the scheme from the first energy utilities in Pennsylvania. Thanks, Dave. I have a question here from Shanti Gumper Rabindran. EDC, so electric distribution companies, do not own generation, but only distribution. Are there enough corporate connections between EDCs in Pennsylvania and power generation companies that an EDC might buy from specific generators or specific sources rather than the cheapest source? Please explain, explain details in First Energy as, as EDC and First Energy as generation owner. Maybe I can take the uh, crack at the first part of that question and Dave can take the second. Um, uh, there are connections between uh, the, the companies, I mean, uh, Pico Exelon is a good example. Uh, again, you know, Exelon is this holding company and Exelon owns power plants. And specifically in Pennsylvania, they own nuclear power plants. Uh, they also own electric utilities. Uh, in, in Pennsylvania, Pico, in Baltimore, Baltimore Gas and Electric, they own the Atlantic City uh, electric utility and also the Washington DC electric utility, Pepco. Um, the concern about sort of preferential treatment to their own power resources, I think is, 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 is a really, I think that's an important concern. I, there are rules sort of within the PJM markets that are supposed to mitigate any behavior like that. Um, you know, and, and, and also within the PUC, because the, the, the area where this comes into play at the Public Utility Commission is, in so-called default service proceedings, where the electric utilities, the EDCs, buy power on behalf of their customers who don't shop on Pennsylvania's retail electric market, the so-called PA power switch. Um, but there are, so there are rules both at, at the PJM interconnection, which is regulated by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and at the PUC that are supposed to prevent that kind of preferential treatment. Uh, as far as I know, they're, they're fairly effective, but I honestly have not ever really looked into that particular issue too much. And I don't know, but Dave, do you want to take the second part of that question or? Um, no. <laughs> okay. okay, I think it was, the, the question was, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, Henry, could you repeat the question? Yeah, um, the, the second part was please explain the details from First Energy as an EDC and, and okay. First Energy yeah. as a generation owner. So First Energy as a, a like First Energy is uh, First Energy Corporation. If you Google First Energy Corporation, you see the sort of the stock price. First Energy Corporation is a publicly traded corporation um, that is basically a utility holding company, meaning that First Energy owns the electric distribution companies that operate in Pennsylvania, West Penn Power, Penn Power, Penelec, and MetEd. So it's kind of a parent-child relationship. Basically the, the particular distribution companies, and, and Dave mentioned some of the, the, the distribution companies that First Energy also has in Ohio and New Jersey and, and, and Maryland, those are also owned by 
First Energy, the, the parent company. And First Energy uh, recently spun off its power resources. That was the Energy Harbor company that, uh, that Dave also mentioned. I would just add to, um, sorry, I missed the question originally, um, that they still own one generation armor thing called the Legacy Energy. Um, and then what's regulated by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is um, for the first energy transmission companies. Um, so that's kind of like another level of regulation and rate making that I think to some degree overlaps with the state stuff too, and like regional grid stuff. We'll call it stuff for simplicity. <laughs> we have a question from Catherine Daniels. Wouldn't it be in the public interest to let residents attach our solar panels to generators? Why do they block that and pay us ridiculously low rates for the difference in the watts used versus those generated when we give more to the grid than we use? And uh, I, I can take a first stab at this. So, so what, what Catherine is talking about here is net metering. You know, it's a process by which when you have solar on your home or business and you're connected to the grid, it's the way you interact with the grid. And in Pennsylvania, the, the, if you're an investor-owned utility customer, we actually have really great net metering. Um, you know, when you export extra energy that you've generated uh, back to the grid, that's value, valued equally to the energy you buy from them. So like if you're generating extra energy in the summer, you uh, can build up a bank of credits on your bill and then you can spend those credits down in the winter when you're not generating as much solar energy as you were in the summer. So you can cover a whole year's worth of energy usage, even though it's not evenly sunny all year. And it's one of the most critical things to make rooftop solar economical because it lets you basically solve the intermittency problem of solar. It doesn't generate energy all the time, but you use energy all the time. Now, it's important to note so, so like, why don't utilities like that? And they generally don't. Um, uh, and the reason we have great net metering, net metering in Pennsylvania is not because the IOUs decided they're gonna institute this great net metering program, it's because they were forced to by the legislature. So this is one of the ways that, you know, your legislative advocacy, talking to your legislators helps um, uh, enforce better behavior from, from electric utilities. And a lot of other states are, you know, net metering has been weakened or eliminated largely because of well-moneyed opposition from utility interests. And the reason they don't like it is because, you know, as Mark was saying, their business model has, has traditionally been sell more energy and then earn a guaranteed profit or build more stuff so you can sell more energy and earn a guaranteed profit. And so when you're all of a sudden growing your own energy, you know, that's less product they're selling you, and they see that as a threat to shareholder profits. They don't describe it that way, but that's ultimately the, the, the threat, you know, the, the, the way they see it. So that's why, you know, what this issue Mark was getting into of kind of changing the utility incentives, making it so the way they make money is not selling more energy because no, we've kind of decided that's no longer in the public in interest. You know, we want them to support renewable energy. We want them to make sure everybody's paying you know, nobody's uh, having their, their uh, electricity shut off because they're paying too much energy. We want to change those incentives to change the behavior, behavior of the utilities. Uh, Mark or Dave, you want to add anything to that, to my rant about net metering? I don't have anything to add. That was a great answer. Oh, that was good. clarification here from, from uh, Bill in the chat. So on a month-to-month -month basis, your credits are in kilowatt hours, you know, what you put out, you get back in. And then at the end of the year, if you have generated more than you used, they pay you out at the, at the lower price to compare rate. So, because um, it is meant to offset your own generation rather than kind of turn you into somebody who's just making money by generating all this energy. Um, so thanks for that clarification, Bill. So uh, another question from Shanti, does the PA legislature need to change what the P PUC can require of utilities, i.e. what it takes, when it takes into account in rate proceedings before PA can move to the Rocky Mountain Institute's suggested business models for EDCs? So unless PA legislature changes the law, PUC can't reward performance. So we're talking about changing the rule, the incentives utilities face. Does the PA legislature need to do something to make that happen? Well, they, they could certainly do more, but in 2018, Pennsylvania passed uh, a statute known as Act 58 of 2018, 
uh, that concerns uh, alternative rate making is the sort of general term. And essentially, you can think of it as a set of tools that utilities can use to move toward new alternative business models that are more consistent with the transition to clean energy. It does not mandate the EDCs to use any of those tools. And I would say so far they have, uh, if they have, it's been, they've made very, very scant use of them. Uh, so the tools are available to them. Before this, this law was passed, there was some ambiguity around some of the particulars. Now they, they pretty much have all the tools they need. They do not have a mandate by the General Assembly. And it would be great to have more, more, more stick, uh, you know, in that regard. Dave, anything to add, add on that? Um, no, just in terms of the political spending front, that was kind of the focus of my um, presentation. We have seen a few states um, like New Hampshire, as well as public utility commissions in recent years, stiffen up their rules. Um, barring the use of ratepayer money for lobbying and different types of political spending. And I think um, the first energy case is really eye-opening and how far those existing laws that are in many states need to be expanded to cover these new types of ways of hiding that spending through like LLCs and IRS entity um, rules called 501c4 and stuff like that. So. Uh, I have a question from from Billy Boyd, I'm a residential solar owner, Pennsylvania SREC, so those are the solar renewable energy credits that, that solar uh, uh, installations earn on top of the energy. We're supposed to help us residential owners pay back for our solar investment. Only recently, the SREC prices have moved up, but still low compared to other states, it's very true. We have to go through arbitrators or brokers to sell our SRECs at a reduced price with commissions. Is there any way us residential solar owners can get better pricing? So that's a great question. Um, SREX are, are kind of another attempt to change the incentives that, that power companies face in order to get them to use more renewable energy. And they're basically putting a price on the environmental value, kind of the, the green value of uh, solar energy uh, as a way to incentivize utility, you know, people using more of them. And the way SREX works is you, whenever you have solar, every time you generate a thousand kilowatt hours, you earn one SREX and then you can sell it. It has a cash value. So it's supposed to kind of uh, help improve your return on investment from solar. And the people buying them are the investor owned utilities because they're required by the legislature to buy a certain amount of SREX every year um, based on how much energy they sell. Now, uh, the reason their SREX prices are so low is because the utilities hardly have to buy any. They have to buy enough to cover half of 1% of their energy sales. Um, so that means they don't have to buy a lot. That means the demand is low. And when you have low demand for a product, you have uh, low prices. That's why our SREC prices are, are, are like $40 right now. Uh, places with really aggressive renewable energy targets that force utilities to buy more renewable energy have like $100 SRECs. And like DC, it's like $400 SRECs. So the only way to change that is get to let the legislature to update those solar goals. And in Pennsylvania, that's called, that's, that's part of the alternative energy portfolio standard. This is something at Solar United Neighbors, we are working very hard to improve, to set higher solar goals for, Pen for Pennsylvania. So we get more solar here. And so solar owners earn more. Um, if you go to our website, solarunitedneighbors.org slash Pennsylvania, um, we have an action alert you can take to help you talk to the legislature about this. We're almost at 8.30 and we have a lot of really great questions in here. So I'm sorry we can't get to all of them. Um, we'll go to the next one here from Bill. Any insight you can provide regarding muni electric authorities and their openness to transitioning to renewable energy? Have you seen some that may not want to reduce their revenue source from their electricity rate by adding renewable energy? Um, I, I can take a, a, a first yeah. stab at this. So there are some municipal electric companies in Pennsylvania that have some renewable energy. Um, the one off the top of my head is the Borough of Ephrata. Public, uh, the, the borough owns the electric company and they have decided that it's in their financial interest to uh, essentially pay for a big solar installation that they get about a third of their energy from. And uh, it wasn't just that you know the energy price was attractive to them, but it also saves them on transmission costs because municipal electric companies 
they're just distribution, you know, just like the IOUs, they're buying their uh, power at wholesale rates from third parties and selling at retail to you. Um, they pay transmission fees essentially to, to get that power to them. And they could save a lot of money by getting their power from this big solar farm that's right next door. So they did that, they saved a bunch of money doing it. I think more should consider this um, to, to save their citizens money. Um, so there are incentives there for them. It's still the same deal for like net metered solar, for rooftop solar, where they may not really see a financial incentive to let their residents do that unless somebody forces them to. I would just add um, a somewhat related issue, not necessarily for uh, public utility and municipality, but a lot of communities across the country are choosing to um, aggregate and purchase elect clean electricity um, through different programs. And also some are starting to um, ban gas in new buildings um, to help support like electrification efforts that are needed for addressing climate change. Um, and we've seen both electric and gas utilities ramp up their lobbying to try to pass bills at the state level to prevent towns from doing um, both of those things. So kind of one of those funky things where you see companies that would often talk about free markets and their lobbying um, turning around and trying to stifle consumer choice at the local level like that. Well, we, we are out of time. Um, I think we're going to just had an hour for this, I believe, yeah. Um, so I'm sorry we couldn't get to everyone's questions. There's a lot of really excellent questions in here and we might try to find some way we can uh, answer these after the fact. We will be sending out a recording of this webinar to everybody who registered, registered even if you didn't show up tonight, um, so you can view it again or share it around and we'll see if we can find a way to, to get some answers to some of these great questions here. Um, so I just wanna, I hope you can see my screen here, you know, Mark listed a lot of ways that citizens can take action to hold utilities accountable and, and fight for a better energy system. I just want to point out one of them here. Um, we have uh, an action alert on our website, Solar United Neighbors does, and I'm going to put a link to it right here in the chat. And this will, you fill this out and it will uh, essentially send a letter to your state legislators asking them to pledge to not take political do donations from utilities to kind of resist this influence that utilities have over the legislature because they have so much money. Um, and also, if you, if you see on this page here, underneath key details written kind of small in the center of the slide, there's a resources button. If you go to that page and click on resources, a lot of excellent resources, a lot of them from Dave's organization, the Energy and Policy Institute, on the world of utilities and regulation and the role of citizens. So I really encourage you to check that out to dive deeper into this subject. And that's it for tonight. I want to thank you all for joining us. Um, this is a topic that can seem dry at times, but it is really important. It is how we provide one of the fundamental inputs to modern life, electricity, and how we do it in a fair way um, and sustainable way. I want to thank Dave and Mark for joining us tonight and sharing their expertise. Um, and, um, you know, Dave and Mark, if, if you're interested, maybe you could put your contact information in the chat here so, so if folks want to follow up with you. Uh, and geek out on any of these details, they can do that. But thank you all very much. I hope you have a good night and uh, it, was, it was good talking to you all about energy policy. Thanks, Henry. Thanks everybody, good night. Thank you.